Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Welcome to Faith and Victory Church this morning. Hallelujah. We're going to be uh, preaching out of Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. This is Resurrection Day. Many, many, many people call it Easter Sunday. And uh, I like to every year to get my little two, two three minute uh, doohickey on Easter. The word Easter does come from the Greek word Ishtar, which was the Greek goddess of fertility, and is not found in the New Testament of the Bible. Uh, it was uh, tra- the word translated Easter really in the Greek is Paschal, and the King James translators, because uh, as the church at Rome had so often done, associated pagan holidays with Christian holidays in order to bring people into the church. Uh, that's how you got. Halloween which, and all Hallowed Eve, you know, it was a celebration, you know, the Halloween was uh, uh, kind of tied in with a All Saints Day, and it became, but you know, that's why you got the goose, ghosts and the goblins and all that stuff, but it was All Hallowed Eve, and uh, they, but that's how it got, and so Easter, the same thing. When they got to there, but the term Easter had been so associated with the date of Passover that they called it Easter, and just translated, the word, didn't even translate the word, just changed it. Uh, so it, it is not even a mistranslation. It was a deliberate t- to associate that day in the minds of the people. So Easter is not the correct term. It is Paschal. It is Passover. It was Passover. And Easter was the Greek goddess of fertility, Ishtar. And so we don't celebrate Ishtar. But that's, you know, you get, now so we, we say we get bunny rabbits and Easter eggs and all that stuff from, you know, the, the, the life, which is okay. We'll do that. But, you know, a lot of that came from Ishtar, so. I don't have any problem with bunny rabbit eggs, you know, or, you know, bunny rabbits and eggs. That's all cool. Hallelujah. We, we, we know the truth, and so we're not, we're not bound by that. We're not celebrating Ishtar. But I do like to say that because I like to call it Resurrection Day. Hallelujah. Amen. I like to refer to it as the day the Lord was resurrected. Hallelujah. And not as much about, you know, the, the name Easter. But on the same time, if somebody in the world comes up to me and says, Happy Easter, I don't go, That's the Greek goddess of fertility, and we don't celebrate that. Now, 25 years ago, I would have done that. Actually, I did do that. Anyway, I have grown up since then. I have matured enough to know you just can't blow the world into hell uh, because you've got to stand on a word. All right? They don't know any better. All right? Hallelujah. So there, there you go. That's it. That's all there is to say about it. It is Resurrection Day. Amen? Now, I might call it Easter because everybody calls it Easter, you know, you know, Hallelujah. But you understand, we understand where that is, and we understand that, so we're cool. I'm cool. You cool? We all cool? Look here uh, at Philippians, the third chapter, uh, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, I, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I might win Christ. And, being, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. Now listen, folks. We can get born again and not know him. We can be born of God and not know him. Does that make sense? In other words, we can be related, we can be acquainted, but not know. And there's a difference between knowing and being acquainted with. Now, there's a lot of people out there in the world that I've met that I'm acquainted with, but I don't know. I don't know if they like, you know, um, uh, turkey gravy at Thanksgiving. Now, Cap, our dear son-in-law, when he came to North Carolina, he didn't do gravy. Not on his turkey and not on his mashed potatoes, you know, because they're they good, they good enough to stand on their own. Until he came to know the flavor of Janie's gravy. <laughs> this past Thanksgiving, he started a new tradition, him and my son. He, he did it. My son copied it. They took their plate, and they made a wall of mashed potatoes around the entire plate with all the other stuff in it. 
and then proceeded to fill the moat with gravy. <laughs> Hallelujah. Came back and there was, there was stuff in there floating underneath all the gravy because he came to know. <laughs> Hallelujah. He came to know the flavor of the gravy and he liked it. <laughs> he now says, thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Why? Why? Because before, you know, he had been acquainted with gravy, but maybe not good gravy. Maybe that stuff you buy at the store on the shelf, you think. Some people think, I thought that was good. You ain't had Janie's gravy. No. Stuff at the store just, you know, when you actually have my wife's gravy, you won't even go buy that stuff and go, that's, de that's demonic. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. But see, he, now that he knows the flavor of gravy on mashed potatoes and on the stuffing and on the turkey, he's, he's come to an experiential knowledge, the epinosis of it. Clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of the gravy. And it has changed his life forever. Amen. See, we want to know Christ. We want to know God. Amen. We want to know him. We want to come to a, a clear, precise, accurate, and experiential knowledge of him. Too many people in the church know of God, know about God, been born again, but they don't know the Lord. They haven't experienced him in his fullness. They, 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 um, they hear about the Lord. They come to church and, and hear how Jesus died for them, hear how Jesus loves them, you know, but they haven't gotten to know him. And something happens when we have experiential knowledge of something. Amen. I said, amen. There, there's something that takes place in us. Now, how many, how many of you ever, uh, you know, now I've, I used to watch on television, they have those commercials about Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. You know, every once in a while they have a commercial and, and they bring that, that 1,200 degree platter out with that steak going. And, and I could say, well, I, I, Ruth Chris serves steaks on a 1,200 degree platter. You know, comes out sizzling. Oh, yeah. I mean, I could look at it and say, that, that would just have to be good. You know? I mean, so, so in, in, in a kind of, you know, just general arena, I could say, well, I know that Ruth's Chris has good steaks. I've seen the pictures. I've heard the sizzle on the commercial. But I hadn't tasted one. Now, I'm going to tell you something. My understanding and knowledge of Ruth's Chris changed when somebody gave me a gift card. And I went in and ordered one of those steaks, you know, one of the big ones. Now, we shared it. I mean, it's, it's not an eat-yourself kind of thing. It's too big. And a side of them mashed potatoes, that's all I need, meat and taters. And, I, and they brought that steak out, and I cut that thing, and the, and the butter on the tray and all that stuff, when you cut it, the, the juice ran out on that, and, started, and just sizzled some more. And I got real fancy and ate continental, turned it backwards, you know, and put it in like that. And I'm going to look like I know what I'm doing, you know. <laughs> Cut. But the little was over. It was devour time. Because once I had tasted and come to know the flavor, I can go to Logan's and I can go to... Uh, Longhorn, I can go all kinds of places and go, that's a steak's okay. But I know Bruce Chris is awesome. It's better because I've experienced it. And Paul said here, he said, I want to know him. Not just, you know, know about him. Not just go to church and get a lesson about him. I want to know him. I want to experience him. I want to have an experiential relationship with the Lord. Not just that I've been born of him and that I'm, I'm related to him because I got saved. I accepted his lordship. I want to come to a place where I have an epinosis, a clear, price, clear precise, and accurate experiential knowledge of the Lord. But then Paul didn't stop there. I might not preach long this morning. Is that all right? If I give you something in 10 minutes that'll, that'll, that'll make you bless your socks off, is that all right? All right, okay. So I'm under no pressure to go to, to 1230. But I like the next statement. And the power 
of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. I want to say something here. The power of his resurrection allows you to be, uh, to um, understand or overcome or live through the fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. The power of the resurrection empowers you to go through and to face the temptations and to face, you know, the persecution and to face the things that we live through on this earth. The power of his resurrection empowers you to do that, glory to God. This is the power. This is dunamis. This isn't exosia. This isn't the authority of his resurrection. It is the miraculous working of his resurrection. And glory to God. Paul said, I want to know him, and I, you know, I, want to have a, you know, I want to know him, but I also want to know the power of his resurrection. Amen. Amen. See, the resurrection changed everything. Yeah. Glory to God. The resurrection changed everything. Up until then, men, men lived and died. If they lived good enough, they would go to Abraham's bosom. If they didn't, they went to hell. And then Jesus came, and from the time he was born to the time that Satan get, took him on the cross, Satan tried to kill him. But Jesus did not come to die for himself. It was the biggest snow job in history on the devil. Had the princes of this world known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But thanks be to God, they didn't know. They kept trying. It's like God just kept dangling that carrot out there and then pulling it away. And dangled that carrot and pulled it away. And dangled that carrot and pulled it away. And by the time that Jesus went to the cross, the devil was so blinded with his rage to kill Jesus, he just went for it, hook, line, and sinker. Glory be to God. And took Jesus. And, and when they crucified him on the cross, the, you know, he took him captive and they came to, took him to hell and they gaped upon him with their mouths and they, they, the ravening and roaring lions were all about him. The dogs have compassed him. They were all about Jesus. You know, tormenting him. God's judgment was poured out on him. Oh, but praise God, there was a day coming. Hallelujah. There was a time coming, glory to God, when God said, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough. To again, I'll be to thee a father, thou shalt be to me a son. Angels of God, worship him. And he came up. And when, he, and when he came up, he spoiled principalities and powers. I'm telling you, hell looked like a pinball machine. Demons were banging off the walls everywhere. Bing, 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 bing. And Satan began to shake because he's sitting on his throne. He thought he's done it. I've taken the plan of God. I've destroyed the plan of God. And now all that I've ever desired and ever wanted, I now have. Remember, he said in the Old Testament, I'll ascend into the heavens. I'll ascend my throne into the heavens. I'll be as the most high. And all God did was say, get out of my presence. And he left as profane from the presence of God. And he came out at the speed of light. Because Jesus said, I beheld him as lightning falling from heaven. He left heaven at 186,000 miles a second. Now, that's if God doesn't understand warp speed. I think he understood it before Scotty got here. All right? And Jesus came with Satan looking. He came down with great wrath. When he was born into the earth, tried to kill him as a baby. Amen? And then, you know, um, then, then after that, you know, they seek the child. They had to go over into Egypt, tried to kill him. You know, spent all that time in Egypt, came back and came, you know, and just lived a life. And then, and then as he grew up, then they tried to kill him. The whole time in his ministry. Remember they took him. And it wasn't even the, it wasn't even the, uh, the, the uh, Romans that were trying to kill him. The Pharisees and bunch got mad with him. And they took him out to the city cliff and tried to throw him off. And he just passed through the midst of them. Jesus went out on the lake on a boat. Said let us go over to the other side. Satan sent a storm. Tried to kill him. Amen. Jesus, Satan tried to get him to commit suicide at the very beginning of his ministry. Cast yourself down from here. For it's written, the angel shall bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Tried to get him to commit suicide. Over and over and over again, Satan was out to kill Jesus. Because he thought if he could kill Jesus, he would stop the plan of God. And all he did by killing Jesus was fulfill and set into full, complete motion the plan of God to redeem humanity. Hallelujah. 
And so Jesus went and paid the price and took our sin, and God raised him from the dead for our justifications. Hallelujah. For our justification, praise God. And Paul comes back now. And remember, the Bible says this, that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you. It shall quicken your mortal body. Glory to God. There is power in the resurrection. Say there's power in the resurrection. And God raised Jesus up by his power, glory to God. By the glory of God, he raised him up, the power of God. And Jesus was raised up. And when he was raised, I said this morning every Winston-Salem, I'm telling you, when Jesus got raised up, he just came by with some folks in the grave, and they got up, walked out, and went to the city. Matthew chapter 28, verse something. Shannon, Shannon looked it up for me when I read it, you know. It says that when Jesus, after, his, after he was resurrected, many God, I mean, they came, came by and got their bodies and got up and went into the city and visited people. Can you imagine Uncle Henry showing up for dinner and he's been dead for 20 years? And Uncle Henry comes by and goes this way. I mean, all of a sudden, they're sitting at dinner and Uncle Henry comes walking in and said, I saw him. I saw the Messiah. I saw the Lord. He's been resurrected. He paid the price for men. Don't you know there was a revival going on? You know, and, and some of them some of them Jews may have been the center going, what did they put in my water today? I thought this was this was new wine. I didn't think it was fermented. This is like Jack Daniels 180 proof or something. I mean, dead folks walking in the building. Hello? People have been dead for 20 years showing up. That's what it says. It says after his resurrection, many that slept came out of their graves and went into the holy city, and many saw them. How did that happen? Resurrection life just passed by. The power of the resurrection that was demonstrated. It's Matthew. Come on. I, I, some of you kind of look at me like, I don't believe that's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I read it this morning. Hallelujah. Glory. It's chapter 27. Verse 52, verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. The earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and, um, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. And that's in the Bible. Bible records all around some of them dead folks laying there. Jesus came by when he was getting up and coming by. And when he came by to pick up his body to go offer his blood, he just passed by. And his resurrection power got off some folks. They got up and walked out of the graves. Now, don't you know there was some talk going on in town? <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, don't you know there's some talk going on in town when them dead folks started walking in there and when they weren't dead no more? And, they, you know, those are the same people when he came, he preached to the captives. He came and preached, preached to them and said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. He got out there and preached to the Bible. So he went and preached to the captives. Yeah. And then when he preached to the captives, they believed on him. Hallelujah. And when he let captivity captive, when he got to heaven, he took some saints in with him, praise God. But a few of them just dropped off and picked up their body. Can you, now this, we don't have a record. We, we can only suppose that somebody, I mean like David may have got up and walked over to the other king. Said, I just want you to know you as a fool. Because I just, I just listened to him. He just preached as the king of kings and lord of lords. He is resurrected. You better believe it. You're in trouble, dude. Well, who are you? I'm David. Guards. Some fool in here saying he's David. Can't do nothing with him. Now, Bible doesn't say what happened to him. I, I'm guessing either they died again or they just went on up. <laughs> Amen. What happens? See, resurrection power has the power to raise. And what I like about it, Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. It's the raising power of God. Jesus is concerned about raising you up. Jesus didn't come to put you down. He came to lift you up. He didn't come to put you off. He came to put you ahead. He didn't come to make you poor. He came to make you rich. Oh, you want them prosperity preachers? I'm not one of them prosperity preachers, but I am a Bible, a Bible prosperity preacher. How do you know? The Bible says that, through, that he became poor, that through his poverty, you might be made rich. That's talking about poor in spirit. Well, study your Bible. Paul writes to the church and says, if you give, you know, do you give abundantly, he'll give to you abundantly. 
Amen. If you give sparingly, you'll get sparingly. You give abundantly, you'll give abundantly. The Bible talks about, you know, over and over again, how that, you know, God gives you the power to get wealthy and may establish his covenant in the earth. Amen. Jesus was poor. He didn't have where to put his head. He was in another city. He needed a place to sleep. If I go, if I go uh, to Charlotte tonight, I'm going to have to get a hotel. Now, we can make it King Jimmy. Pastor Ed hath nowhere to lay his head. That don't mean I don't have a home. I got a home in Greensboro. I'm in Charlotte. What's that mean? I need some place to sleep. It, you know, well, how do you know Jesus had money? He had a treasurer. I, 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 I dare you. Go up here to one of the intersections in Greensboro this afternoon where they're standing there and say, we'll work for food, you know, Vietnam vet, uh, whatever they, people put on there, you know. We, we had somebody in church one time went by and tried to hire somebody to come paint. They said, I ain't painting this. But you got on a sign that says, I will work for food. Well, I ain't doing that. I'm going to pay you five. And back then, five dollars an hour was decent money. I'll pay you five dollars an hour. I ain't doing that. All right. I dare you. I dab, double dog dare you. Go find you somebody and ask them who their treasurer is. What? Who's your treasurer? Man, I don't need no treasure. Why not? I don't have that kind of money. Who needs treasurers? People with lots of money. As a matter of fact, Jesus had so much money in his dowry that Judas was stealing it and they didn't know it. Think about this. When it came to the 5,000, it wasn't that they didn't have enough money to feed them. It was too far to go buy it. Read it. Read the story. Read it real well. It's too far to go get the stuff. What not they couldn't buy it? They could have bought it. They could have gone and bought and fed the people. But it was too far. They would have fainted before they got back with the food. So Jesus performed the miracle. He didn't perform the miracle because they were broke. He performed the miracle because they needed, it was too, took too long to get them the food. So I'm saying, the, the resurrection power of God will affect your finances. It will affect your body. God wants you well. God doesn't want you sick. It will affect your mind. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, the power of the resurrection is supposed to be affecting every arena of your life. And it's supposed to be resurrecting it, making it full of life, making it blessed. Because God, Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Everything Jesus touched, touched prospered. Everything Jesus touched was re Just think about how much power it would be. That he just passes by some dead folks and they get up and won't go out in the city early. Just because he came, he, he slipped by them. Y'all here, you're going home. Some of y'all are going to be driving home today. And you're going to be riding in your car. You're going, you know, Pastor Jay was talking about, you know, that Jesus passed by them dead folks. And they got up and walked out of the grave. And his resurrection power was so strong. And all of a sudden, you're going to go, wow, glory to God. Going to touch my body. Going to touch my finances. Going to touch my head. Going to touch my household. That resurrection power. It raises, it's raising power. It's not dead power. God didn't come to make you dead. He came to make you alive. Some folks think that when they get into the church, they're supposed to look like they've been baptized in vinegar and lemon juice. I'm serving the Lord. My God, let your faith know you're serving the Lord. It's supposed to be life. His life. His resurrection life. You get born again. It starts in your spirit. You get passed from death unto life. Your spirit becomes once again uh, restored and reconciled in fellowship with God. He became one with his father of spirits himself. Hallelujah. The power of the resurrection can take a spiritually alienated man or woman and reconcile them to God. And the term used in the New Testament is justification. And we like to say it this way. We kind of joke about it. You know, we kind of use it as a little, you know, thing. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. God's resurrection power can make you stand before the Father righteous, declared righteous by the mouth of the creator of heaven and earth. 
That resurrection power can cleanse you from all unrighteousness and bring you into perfect relationship with the Father himself. Paul said, I want to know that resurrection power. Why? So that it doesn't just affect our spirit, but so through the renewing of the mind, that resurrection power takes hold in the soul of man. And we receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save sozo, but not your spirit, not your pneuma, your suke. James says, you know, receive with meekness the engrafted word of God which is able to save sozo, your soul, your suke. See, the spirit of man is called the pneuma in the Greek. Your spirit is pneuma. Your soul is suke. Psychology, <laughs> you know, Psychiatry, psychology, those, those, those words came out of the root word of the Greek suke. Okay? The mind, the will, the emotions. God wants to make your mind and your will, your emotions, and resurrect, have resurrection power affect them. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but that of power and of love and of a sound mind. Glory to God. God wants to affect you. With his, Paul, Paul was like, oh man, I just want to know the power of his resurrection. Why? Because he knew that resurrection power would enter into him in different arenas of life and begin to let God's life work in it. Change and transform and do things there you can't do in the own, your ability. Glory to God. Thinking of the resurrection power working in us. Not only that, he wants, to, he wants that to affect your, your soma, your body, your flesh. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it'll quicken, it'll make alive. What? Your mortal body. Now, here's the thing. We don't get, we don't get weird. You know, Christians come on and get weird sometimes. Well, if God's life's in me, I'll never die. Well, that's, the scripture says it'll quicken and make alive your mortal body. You're still death doomed. Okay, your body's going to die unless Jesus comes back. All right? It's going to happen. Well, if I have enough faith, I can live forever. Have you noticed Paul's not here? And I pretty much think Paul had more faith or understood faith as well as anybody. Well, John the Baptist, I mean, John, John the, uh, the, the, the apostle John, the, the beloved apostle whom Jesus loved is not dead. How, how do you know that? Because he said, what is it if he, he remains until I come again, Peter, feed my sheep? So there's rumor went out, and Paul, John says, and there's a rumor that went out from that day that, that I wouldn't die. Basically, I'm paraphrasing a little bit. That I wouldn't die because I would stay until Jesus comes again. He said, but that's not true. You know, you know, pe pe I, I knew people who believed that. I went to Raymond with people who believed that, that John's still on the planet somewhere. Cooked him in oil, did all kinds of stuff, couldn't kill him. So he's sitting out on some island somewhere, just writing, just, just wait, just spending time with the Lord. Now, the, the Lord just said, what is it to you if I, if I wanted him to do that? You do what I told you to do. In other words, he was using that as a parallel. You know, you do what I told you. It doesn't matter what he, he does. Because he told, he told Peter he was going to be crucified upside down, you know. Anyway, people get weird. Don't get weird. It will keep your body well. It will keep your body sound. Resurrection life. Oh, if we, Paul, if we begin to cry out like Paul, to know him and the power of his resurrection. To know the resurrection life and the resurrection power of Jesus Christ on a daily basis, affecting all areas of life. Now, I'll be honest with you, I, I bet all of us in here can say, well, there's days I don't do that. Yeah, I know, we, that, but that's because we have to, we have to work, we have to work and, and maintain a, a, a vigilant vision to stay, maintain that kind of lifestyle, lifestyle. We have to want to live that way. We have to cry out like Paul, I want to know him and the power of a resurrection. You can't be going around wishing, don't Jesus, I need, some, I need some resurrection power. I wish I knew where the resurrection power is. It's already in you. It's already on the inside. The apostle John wrote in his first, his first epistle, he said, he said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Glory to God. The 
one who bears the resurrection life. Now remember, John, uh, John, the Holy Spirit baptized you into the body of Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We know the power through knowing him and walking in him. It's, he is the resurrection. What's that mean? That means when Jesus comes in contact with it, it's resurrection. There's another phrase for it. It's called the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. When we let that law work, the law of sin and death has to kneel and bow its knee to the power of the resurrection. Whatever you've been through, whatever you've dealt with, whatever you're facing, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, whether it's physical, whether it's mental, I am telling you that there is, some, there, there is power in the resurrection to eradicate the effects of the law of sin and death trying to work against you and in you and through you. Satan wants to, he wants to ring, take you through the ringer and take you down. But Jesus came to deliver you from the ringer and take you up. Hallelujah. And then in the midst of circumstances of life that are destructive and sent to destroy you. His resurrection power. I said his resurrection power. Glory to God. His resurrection power. Then in that dunamis of the resurrection, the miraculous working power of the resurrection flow out of your life into your th these different aspects of life. Well, how do we do it? We do that through studying the word, meditating on the word, fellowshipping with the Father. We release that power through, through doing those different things. But I'm telling you, we have to understand there is that the power is resident and available. Let me give you a, a new a, an example in the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was called, remember the Kenyan said, you know, Jairus came to Jesus and said, come, my little girl's uh, about to die. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal her. He's on the way. And he's got all those people following him. And the Bible says thronging him. I mean, bumping all over him. I mean, it's like going down to uh, maybe downtown for the fireworks. And you can't even move. Everybody's bumping into you and all that stuff. And you start trying to find out who's hit you. Everybody's hitting you. You can't even walk without getting run into. You know, anybody been in a crowd like that before? I mean, you just get bumped off. That's a throng. And Jesus, the Bible says, and, you know, and, and, and the Bible says this, and while he's on the way, it says, and, and a woman came in the press and touched, and behind him and touched his clothes, for she uh, said, well, it actually says this. There was a, there was a, actually, I, I kind of left out something. It says in the story, after he's on his way to Jairus' house, the Bible says, and there was a certain woman who, who uh, with an issue of blood, had suffered many things of many physicians for 12 years. It was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind him and touched his clothes. For she said, if I could touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. Power. She walked by and touched him. Just got just touched his clothes. And he felt something leave him. Now, all these other people bump, bumping into him, running into him, touching him. Oh, I touched that guy. Was te that teacher. I but see, something, something else released that, that. Her faith released that. Yeah. But I'm telling you, and this, this, God is saying, see, the power of the resurrection is resident. If you, we learn to tap into it by faith, we're going to release that power because it's there. I said it's there. Now, right here, up, up front this morning, there is, a, there is a receptacle sitting right here. Everybody, can, can y'all mostly all see that right there? There's a receptacle right there. Now, this is a lot of people with the receptacle. Wonder what that fan will do. Fan's pretty cool. I like that fan. You know? What's this do? Nothing. I'm touching the receptacle. How many know there's power in that receptacle? How many don't believe there's any power in that receptacle? Get it, Bobby P, and come on up here. <laughs> there is power available in there right now. 
that I can sit here all day long and just do this. Touch it with curiosity. Wonder, wonder what this thing, what's this little circle right here under the two slots there? You know? Nothing. It's just there. But I got a faith fan. I heard that if you put this into that plug, you get power. Or the power will make this blade spin, and I'll have cool air blowing on me. I heard. See, when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind him and touched his clothes. Now, I've been touching this all this time, holding on to the cord too, and now the thing was happening. As soon as that plug went in there, the power that was resident began to flow. Are you here? Now, you, can't see, you can see my hair blowing. You can hear it in my microphone now. The power was resident in Jesus, just like the power is resident in that receptacle right now. But until something tapped into it, it didn't flow out. But the, did you see what happened? So, as soon as I got that plug in there, that fan started going. Zzzz. Now I turned the switch on the fan on ahead of time because, you know, we got to keep the switch of faith turned on. <laughs> Amen. Keep the switch of faith turned on. Anyway, got to keep that switch of faith turned on. And Jesus was walking with resident power. And the multitude was thronging him. The multitude was bumping up against him. But one woman came by when she heard that you could plug into Jesus and get something. She plugged, and he felt virtue go out of him. And let me say something. That was Jesus. That same power of the resurrection is resident in you this morning. And we can tap into that with the plug of faith. And we can tap into that and, and have good and walk spiritually alert and sound before God. We can get our minds renewed to the Word of God. We can have our bodies whole before the will of God. We can tithe and give and see blessings come to us financially by the by doing. We can tap into that power, that resurrection, and it bless every area of our life, and be available to minister to other people. See, it's not just about us getting blessed. It's also about us blessing others. I was at Walmart, some of you heard here, but I was at Walmart about four, three weeks ago. Had gone in to get something for the stage or something. I forgot we were in, in the remodel. And I was there, and this older man came walking up. He came limping up, and he, he leaned up against the, the drink machine there, and his, his family was behind him, and, and uh, his wife and the uh, kid. And, and I looked over and said, uh, tired? He said, no, man. He said, man, I had knee surgery. He, and my, he said, if I had known my knee was going to hurt like this, I wouldn't even have had it. It's hurt worse than it did before I had the surgery. And I said, oh, and I turned around. I did. Don't you tell me you ain't done that before. And when I turned around, the Lord said, well, you're going to practice what you preach. <sighs> yes, I'm sorry, Father. I, yeah, I am. So I didn't have a five-minute discussion with the Lord about it. I just turned back around and said, can I pray for you? And he kind of looked at me like, I said, I said, can I pray for you? He said, well, yeah. Now, you know how most people think you're going to do when you say, can I pray for you? That means you're going to go home, and they, you're going to leave the store, and they're supposed to go home and pray for you when they get home. That won't going to do him any good. So I said, okay. And I just bent over, reached out, and grabbed that knee and prayed in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father, for restoring his knee. I thank you for taking the pain out. I thank you for making him every whole hold the name of Jesus. And, he, and when I got done praying, I looked up at him. He said, I believe that. I believe that. I believe in that. I said, well, go for it then. <laughs> then I went back over and got back in line. Well, next thing I know, because, you know, the line, his family's behind me, and, and I see him, he walks off. And he's walking all around the front of, of the store. He comes back up and says, it's already better. <laughs> I said, glory to God. He turns his life, it's already better. He, he's, he's all excited about it. The power is there. The resurrection power is there. The power of the resurrection can help other people. We're not just about us. It's, it's affect our lives, but it's to help other people too. 
Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Now, as a minister, I know I, I have a ministry along certain lines, but I'm telling you, you had that power working in you too. Remember Winston this morning, we had one lady, she came and she had all kinds of allergies. I mean, she's sniffling, snobbling, and our eyes running, and nose, and <laughs> all the whole time I'm preaching. And I'm preaching on the power of the resurrection. And so I give altar call. Anybody need to be saved? Anybody need to, be, anybody need to get back? Your back so get right? Anybody not baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues? Anybody need to be healed of sickness? And she don't even raise her hand. I'm thinking, my God, woman, you've been sniffling the whole service. And she won't get up. So I said, I walk over there to her. I said, get up and come over here. She said, I'm going to start crying. Then it's going to be worse. Because, you know, he start crying all the silences and stuff swelled. I said, nah, let me pray for you. <laughs> so I lay hands on her while I'm praying for you. I can hear her. Her breathing, and I hear it clear up as she's just standing there being prayed for. And then when I get down, she goes, <laughs> She said, I can breathe. I said, Aren't you glad I came over here and prayed for you? Yeah. <laughs> what? The power of the resurrection. It affects people's lives. Well, you're a preacher. No, no, no. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that the, uh, these signs should follow them that believe. How many in here believe? These signs are supposed to follow you. But they'll lay hand, you'll cast out devils, you speak with new tongues, you lay hands on sick, they shall recover, you drink any of the other thing that won't hurt you. I mean, you're, you're, if you're a believer, you're supposed to, you can, well, it's not you, it's the power of the resurrection work, working and flowing out. Yes. Bringing God's life into your life to bless you and to minister to you and to flow out of you and bless and minister to others. Hallelujah. And we don't have to be concerned about, you know, listen, if there's no faith involved, something, you know, people aren't going to get some stuff sometimes there's no faith involved, but I'm telling you, <clears throat> you got to get out there and be, let, just let it be resident and stay, stay in tune with God so that power is available so whenever somebody comes by and taps into it, they can get a hold of it. You never know. I'm telling you, you never know what's going to happen when somebody taps into that power of the resurrection that's resident within you. We just had uh, over in Winston, um, some of y'all know Crystal, Sandy's oldest daughter, or her father. You know, they, they, they've been uh, not husband and wife for a long time. Well, most of you know, was since Crystal was a baby. But her father was in an accident and a tree fell on him. Tree trunk, big hunk of tree, not, not the whole tree, but a big long part of a trunk, off a truck or something, crushed seven vertebrae. Punctured his lungs, broke ribs, and he was. <clears throat> and I was over there on Thursday night, and we prayed over prayer call because I didn't, have, I couldn't go up to the hospital. She was going to go. Now this guy's in horrible shape, not really doing real good. Not sure if he's going to live. She, saw Thursday, he's already been stepped down out of intensive care into a regular room. Got feeling in his legs and feet. See that power. That resurrection is transformative. I say it's transformative. Let me say, we, you know, in the past three years or two years, two and a half years, we've had some phenomenal things take place out of this church with prayer claws, stage four cancer healed, stage two cancer healed. Just had somebody else over in Winston-Salem. They, they were on radiation and um, on chemotherapy and all, and chemotherapy and, and, and I forgot which stage cancer they were in, sent a prayer cloth. They're off the chemotherapy already. I mean, they're just, you know, they can't find any trace of the cancer. Think, well, that's just the power of the resurrection. It's not, it's not Ed Taylor. It's not Faith and Victory Church. It's the power of the resurrection. There's nothing special about me. It's just the anointing, manif a manifest anointing of the power of the resurrection working in people's lives. We pray over a prayer cloth. It's just the power of the resurrection going into that cloth and hitting a body, and it coming out, and doing what the power of the resurrection does. It raises, it fixes, it delivers, it sets free, it heals, it makes whole. We're seeing phenomenal things. People we don't even know, they've never met, haven't come in contact with, still haven't, they didn't even come to our church. Stuff went out to them, and they, and they get blessed. You know what, that's okay. Why? Why? We don't know that that woman followed Jesus' ministry after she got healed. She may have just gone back home and got in her house, went to all the doctors, said, I want my money back. <laughs> you 12 years you tried to fix me. I just touched Jesus one time and got up. I want my money back. I don't know if she did that. We have no record that she, of, of her again in the Bible. 
We don't know that she came and followed him or hung around his ministry after that. We do know she got touched by it. Amen? So God's resurrection power. Paul wanted to know the power of the resurrection. We can, people's lives can be transformed because we bring that with us where we go. And I'm going to tell you something. You need to get up and look in the mirror every morning and say the power of the resurrection is resident within me. And then whenever it's needless, let it flow out. Let people plug in. You plug in. Amen. I mean, matter of fact, I'm getting a little warm because these lights are hot. Thank God. For the power of the fan. I'm going to try to get off this microphone here. Thank God for the pop. power of the fan. <laughs> power of the fan. You don't watch the minions. It'll mess you up. <laughs> Go tell all of our fans, you know. And so he running around to all the fans talking in the fan. <laughs> Praise God. Today, it's Resurrection Sunday. We want you to know that the resurrection is, you're, you are alive unto God through the resurrection. And like Paul, we need to come to a place we know and understand the power of the resurrection and what it will do in our lives and how it can flow out of us and touch others, and bring them into contact with God's resurrecting power. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.